where, where do we draw the boundaries? Like, for example, is are, are, is it the political boundaries that were drawn after 1947? Uh, because you know, food evolved much before that. Um, agriculture um, in this part of the world um, has been has been around for almost uh, I would say nine to ten thousand years, right? Um, and so, the every every place from the Indus Valley onwards, which is today in modern day Pakistan uh, for the most part. Um, has shown uh, that they ate uh, barley and wheat, not rice, uh, barley and wheat, uh, billets um, and uh, sesame uh, being the central uh, sort of oil source and so on. So this is a this is a part of the world uh, that that has had a interestingly rich agricultural tradition, and it is estimated that rice actually originated independently, both in China as well as India. But the variety of rice we use now is is a hybrid of the natively Indian variety and the Chinese variety. But this hybridization happened almost three, 4,000 years back. Um, and it kind of started in the Bihar and Bengal region. So meaning that uh, uh, as a South Indian, we like to think that you know we are more rice eaters than, um, uh, than North Indians. Uh, but no, rice is not native to South India. Uh, came much, much later. Uh, South Indians are natively, historically, millet eaters. Uh, and so there's some fascinating history. Uh, and then, you know, the reason I'm going through all of this uh, fun history bits is that, so we just give a little bit of time before people come so we can jump straight into the science. Uh, and uh, the reason I kind of give this history is that sometimes uh, when you look at tradition, uh, you have to consider history, okay? And there are two aspects to that. So there is the historical aspect of it. And the second is the, is the tacit knowledge or wisdom of it, right? Uh, the tacit knowledge or wisdom uh, comes from grandmothers and mothers and, and largely women cooking in the kitchen. So that's essentially where it comes from. Uh, and this knowledge being passed on orally, right? Uh, you know, one, this is uh, uh, for, for purely historical and cultural reasons. Uh, India did not, uh, India was, so the Indus Valley used to write things down. They had a script. But then the, uh, the Vedic period that came after that for almost 1,500 years, uh, one, it was not urban. Two, it wasn't into writing. Uh, it was strictly into oral tradition. So the uh, the entire, uh, all of the Vedas and all the rest of the stuff was actually only orally transmitted. Nothing was written down. Uh, and so the oral tradition thing is a very strong thing in India. And one of the reasons why there is very little writing about food in general, uh, uh, barring one or two Sanskrit texts, there is no writing about food. And the only serious writing about food happens in the context of medicine. So which is also why uh, we in India like to combine nutrition, health and food in very deep ways uh, that the West does not. So in West, uh, diet is separate, flavor is separate. So you're talking about flavor, it's always unhealthy, right? But in India, we don't, you know, we always like to uh, combine the both. So there is there is that as well. Um, but the interesting thing about tacit knowledge is, is that uh, it's easy to say that, no, no, they didn't understand science and so on. But the fact of the matter is that cooking happens every day in the kitchen. Um, and essentially over time, People figure out what works, what does not work, uh, what keeps the family healthy, what does not keep the family healthy. And that knowledge is what kind of gets passed around from you know uh, mother to daughter and mother-in-law to daughter-in-law and so on. So that's always been how a lot of Indian cooking has evolved. And it's only the 20th century that we seriously started writing things down. And again, only two generations since women have had access to literacy. Okay, So this is the historical context um, in which we talk about Indian cooking, or subcontinental cooking, if you really want to be. Uh, the same because the styles of cooking, if you take all the way from parts of Afghanistan to, to what is today Pakistan, to India, uh, to, to Sri Lanka, uh, to, to significantly to the east of India, all show very similar patterns, actually all the way up to Iran uh, to an extent, right? They, sh they show similar styles of cooking um, and that's, that's sort of unique um, in its own way. And it's what I call a, a fat and spices centering cuisine, meaning that flavor comes from fat and spices. That's the primary goal, right? So all dishes start with fat, uh, they start with spices. So depending on the region, you use a kind of fat. So uh, coconut oil in um, in in Kerala, uh, sesame oil in 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 Tamil Nadu, and ghee in Rajasthan or Gujarat, uh, mustard oil uh, in in Bengal or Bihar, uh, kind of define the the fundamental fat flavor profile. And different spices are used uh, based on you know geographically where they were available, uh, and so on. So the other interesting thing is that there is a uh, I wanted to keep the stock slightly provocative uh, to make you think about this by saying that there are common misconceptions um, about, about Indian cooking. Uh, and in a sense that sometimes they're marred by people insisting that that tradition is only correct. Uh, and also insisting that's, uh, that a lot of the pseudoscientific ideas that come sometimes from modern day 
uh, uh, interpretation of nutrition and so on with no basis in science. Um, and, and last but not the least, and, and I know, um, I know, uh, you know, uh, my host just said that you know uh, the vegetables grown without chemicals and so on. And, and I and we kind of get where where that idea comes from that there is a there is a modern day agricultural industrial agricultural practice of of essentially growing things at large scale uh, and and so therefore causing harm to the planet in that sense, right? Uh, but what happens is that sometimes people carry that idea that chemicals are bad uh, to ridiculous levels. At a very basic level, everything is chemical. Okay, so sodium chloride is as much chemical as as uh, as sucrose uh, as the the pesticides that you use uh, in that level. So I think what is important to is to have a deeper understanding. Um, and for people who are in particularly the uh, the farming as well as the organic food business, uh, to understand this nuance and be able to better communicate, you know, what they do, because uh, there are genuinely scientifically valid reasons why organic food is not just better for the planet, uh, but also tastier. Um, and it's the taste part that I'm interested in. I'm not a nutritionist, so we'll kind of get into that. So maybe with that introduction, I'm just going to quickly, you know, get into my presentation. So, uh, why? What is actually food science? Okay. So I I wrote this. Uh, the reason I wrote this book is again because of a couple of factors, and I that I briefly mentioned. One is that no one seems to have written a book on the science of Indian cooking, right? So there's a there's tons of history, there's tons of art, there's tons of tradition. Uh, there are fantastic books uh, that deal with specific regions, fantastic books about, say, cooking of Mysore, the cooking of Hyderabad, uh, the Nawabi and uh, Nawabs and uh, the Nizams in Hyderabad, the cooking of Malabar, the cooking of Chettinad or Punjab or whatever it is. Um, but there's, uh, there is not, there has never been a scientific exploration of why is it what what we do in the kitchen uh, works, or in the, in the sense that why is our grandmother's tacit wisdom uh, makes sense, right? Although they may not have been able to explain the science, but it still works. Okay, uh, and so first, therefore, was the idea of documenting it using the language of science, and I'll tell you why using the language of science, uh, and and it's important to not see this as some sort of a arrogant. Uh, this thing that oh science will explain everything you know these other illiterate people do not know anything um, is a very arrogant position to take um, and, and in a sense what it actually does is that it 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 essentially looks at thousands and thousands of years of practical tacit wisdom in the kitchen and says no no i understand science and this is the right way to do it i think that's the wrong way to do it um, the idea the idea behind using science as a means of communication is simply because uh, science communication is intrinsically uh, something that is unambiguous in that you can communicate in a way that people uh, will not misunderstand, right? Uh, and the other thing is that science communication can be challenged, meaning that the way science works is by other people challenging it all the time. When something better comes, scientists will be the first one to say, I'm wrong because you published a paper that proved that my data was wrongly interpreted and you have better data. Um, and that's how science grows, right? Um, it's not like I'm right because, you know, I have more money or, or I have more land and so on. So therefore, uh, part of the one way of making sure that the tacit wisdom that we have, uh, that we increasingly are at risk of losing, uh, again, largely because, you know, we live in cities, we we have lost our relationship with food. Uh, you know, for example, uh, somebody who's maybe my, you know, people from my grandparents' generation were very close to the land. They kind of knew how things were grown. Uh, they were very close to their food. Uh, once you're in a city, you're swigging your food. Uh, you have no idea what ingredients are being used. Uh, you have no idea how it was prepared. Uh, you have no idea of the person who's preparing it. Uh, and you really have you you have that very distant relationship uh, with food in that sense. And that the pandemic, in some sense, has actually changed that. And one of the reasons I wrote this book is to say that, that if young people are wanting to learn cooking right now, um, it's and and they don't have access to grandmothers and and mothers not if they're you know staying by themselves in the city. They need to have a manual um, that really explains why we do what we do through the language of science. So that's that's the reason why I wrote this book. Okay. So essentially, food science is nothing more than what happens when flavor molecules in food, right? So the like protein, uh, those, those are in spices and so on, uh, proteins, carbohydrates, uh, fats, and also you know uh, phytochemicals that are nu nutrients, the vitamins, uh, vitamins, uh, and uh, a lot of, a lot of the antioxidants and so on. What happens when they react with each other at various proportions, temperatures, and pressures? Okay, um, and I think if when you really dig into it, 
some very foundational things uh, that people sometimes don't realize and i'll cover them in the uh, in the in the misconceptions themselves right so this is this is what it is uh, and it there is also this recognition that uh, cooking doesn't start when you heat stuff okay cooking starts when you cut stuff particularly for vegetables uh, the difference between vegetables and say meat is the fact that uh, meat is already the cells in meat are already dead uh, when when the animal dies uh plants are living till the point you actually either cut them or cook them okay only when you do cellular damage uh do plants plant uh, tissue actually dies okay uh and so therefore you have to fundamentally think differently about it so the moment you cut something that is when chemical reactions start happening till then it's much slower so the cell will uh try as much as possible to keep external things away it will prevent oxidation you know and, and things like that right which is why you know the moment you cut vegetable sometimes it grows brown at that point uh, is because that's when enzymes uh encourage the oxidation because there's been cellular damage um, and so on right uh, and again temperature is is crucial because uh, different things happen at different temperatures uh, our grandmothers knew this intuitively they know exactly when to increase the heat when to lower the heat and for what ingredient um, and what at what stage during the cooking process to achieve what kind of outcomes right so understanding what happens below the boiling point of water which is 100 celsius at uh, at sea level uh, and what happens above that is very very important because that's what is the distinction between say deep frying and sauteing versus you know cooking in water cooking a gravy which is mostly water and so on and pressure obviously is critical because understanding pressure is why you're able to do pressure cooking uh, and pressure cooking is is a very very important part of the indian kitchen because of our reliance on particularly on dals okay uh, and uh, legumes actually take a lot more cooking time you know and uh, and nobody has you know 2 to 3 hours to sit and you know cook uh, those things on an open pot and so pressure cooking becomes a very very critical element of the modern indian kitchen uh, and so on uh, if uh, i think uh, a, a, could i request the host to turn off annotations i think you know people are scribbling on the screen so accidentally could be so maybe i think you might want to turn that off right uh, and and in in general you know um, food science is critical for people who are doing industrial food production so a guy making uh, like biscuits and so on uh, needs to understand right down to the molecule what's happening uh, because you you need every 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 piece of biscuit uh, to actually taste exactly the same right and so this is a this is a, a critical element of industrial food production but i would actually argue that everyone in the food business and everyone who is a consumer also needs to have a modicum of understanding of food science because one it helps you make delicious food it helps you understand how delicious food is made it helps you understand how delicious food is grown and all of these things are important uh, to build a more conscious customer uh, and farmer relationship in the in the world in the changing world of uh, you know climate change uh, that we live in where this relationship is far far more more important uh, i think there will be more climate disruptions the more local we get the more organic we get the closer we get people to food uh, the the more direct the relationship between farmer and consumer uh the more resilient our food systems will be for the future uh, especially we will have no way to predict when floods will come when forest fires will come when monsoons will fail um and these and these will happen with more frequency as we get towards the the climate change future uh, that you know that we seem to be headed towards right um and as i said indian food has a documentation problem right it has a uh, it's not been written down for a, a lot of time um in fact even the the 12th century text manasolasa uh has ingredients okay no no recipes right so the assumption is that you know exactly what to do right and and clearly i think the assumption also there was also this historical sense that uh uh food enjoying what you eat was historically not considered a good thing uh, at least amongst hindu jain and uh, uh buddhist traditions because asceticism um, and treating food as a bare essential and not eating things that are you know rajasik tamasik and so on uh, so the gunas of food all of those things kind of dictated the fact that for most of history the idea that you can enjoy food uh, was not considered a great thing this is this is irony because this this is a part of the world that produces some of the most delicious food on the planet okay and yet historically we're not supposed to enjoy too much of it and so therefore what we find is that there is not too much writing on the pleasures of food till we get to almost the 13th and 14th century uh, and then you start having people writing about the actual pleasures of flavor of mouth feel and things like that right uh, uh, and again what the problem is that we kind of got to the internet and the internet grew very very fast and people rely only on the internet for knowledge now 
Um, and so the internet is great at giving you access to knowledge, but it's not great at giving you access to verified knowledge. And you have no way of knowing what's a good recipe, what's a bad recipe, what will work, what will not work. Um, and there's just so, so much conflicting information as well. So the idea is that if you understand the science, uh, then it gives you a set of tools uh, to look at content of the internet and decide, oh, this makes sense versus this does not make sense. So this is a YouTube channel I can trust. And this is a YouTube channel that's not really good um, and so on. So that's also the reason, right? And last but not the least, as I said, grandmothers may not know food science, but they know cooking, okay? Um, and that's the only knowledge that counts. Uh, we are using science to explain uh, cooking. We're not trying to say, no, science is better. You you change your way of cooking using science. That's not the way to think about it at all, right? Uh, the best cooks, intuitively in innately do things that tend to work in the kitchen right they may not know exactly why it works and sometimes the reason they give you may be wrong and i and i will point that out right uh but you cannot ignore the knowledge and i think uh there is this uh there's this fantastic metaphor called the uh the, the fence problem by Nassim Nicholas uh, Taleb. He's a, he's a thinker who basically says that if you just walk around and suddenly you see a fence right uh and and you don't quite see what the fence, uh, what it is there for, right? So it seems to be somewhere in the middle of somewhere, and there is a fence, right? Uh, and you're like, it's it's preventing you from getting past. You know, would you would you would you just simply destroy the fence, right? Uh, because you don't know exactly what the fence is protecting, when it was built, and why it was built, uh, and to protect what, right? And you don't know what lurks on the other side of the fence, right? And so, in general, he says that sometimes a lot of tacit wisdom, a lot of traditional knowledge. Uh, in the modern times, people tend to say, oh, you know what, this is not scientific. And so therefore, I will I will, I will, will go completely by science and I will stop doing these things. Uh, and therefore, without, and so what, you don't know what knowledge you're losing uh, when you do that, right? So I think that's that's the humility that is required when you think about this uh, in general, okay? So so I'll do this in the form of a, a, a slightly interactive, I'm not, I mean, I know it's, it's disruptive to do it interactively with such a large audience. But what I'll do is that I'm going to, uh, this is the way I'm going to do it. So, so you'll find three cartoons that I will use in each slide. Um, and the, one of them looks like this, okay? Uh, kind of thinking, right? So uh, the second one looks like this, which is like frustrated, right? Saying that, how, how, can, you, how can you believe this, okay? Um, and, and the third one says that this is, just, this is just downright ridiculous, okay? So the point here I'm trying to say is that if you see this, it means that, hi, you know what? the way you normally do it, it actually works, but not for the reasons you think it does. So I want you to reconsider the way you think, right? Uh, so that way you you can still continue to do what you're doing, but you can then apply it to other uh, other techniques and, and your knowledge is a lot more solid in that sense, okay? This is just, this is just, oh no, this is just terrible. Uh, this is, this is just, uh, uh, you are, uh, you've got the reasoning completely wrong. And the last one is just, this is pure internet era misinformation, okay? That even our grandmothers didn't believe in this, okay? That they somehow just grew up only in the internet uh, believing something like this, okay? So these are the three uh, things that you will you will essentially say, okay? So uh, so the first one, and, and the way I'm going to do this is that I'll use each one of these misconceptions to explain some of the scientific ideas that I present in the book. Uh, so that way we'll kind of dig deep into this. So although I will start with a common misconception, but it will dig deep into each one of them, right? So the very first, I'll start with a very simple one uh, that you see in many recipes on the internet that uh, if you're cooking anything starchy, typically like noodles or anything like that, uh, after you boil the noodles uh, in water uh, to prevent, uh, they say that if you add oil to the water when you're boiling it, um, it will prevent the noodles from sticking, right? This is a, this is a common misconception. Now, this is just completely nonsense. Okay. Now the reason is is because this is the sort of thing where you are roughly going in the right direction, uh, but you're applying it wrongly. Okay. So yes. So obviously it comes from the fact that oil and water do not mix, and so the general idea is that if there is oil on the surface of something, it will prevent it from sticking to each other because sticking happens uh, in the presence of water. Okay. So that's basically the the, the chemistry of it. Right. So. The only problem here is that adding what teaspoon of oil to boiling water uh, does absolutely nothing because what works is if you add the oil to the noodles after you remove them from water and then you just rub the coat the noodles with oil, that will help because then the, the hot and the sticky surfaces of the noodles have a coating of oil and that prevents uh, sticking after the noodles have been cooked. 
adding the oil to the water itself is going to do nothing except waste the oil. Because all that happens is that oil floats, it goes straight on top and oil does not mix the water. It does not go anywhere near the noodles at all. Okay. So, which are actually inside the water, the oil is just simply going to float on top. It achieves absolutely nothing. And I want to, I want you to sort of understand a couple of very key non-intuitive things. Okay. The first non-intuitive thing is the fact that uh, fat is one of those things that actually does not react with your food. Okay. And let me explain react. React meaning that, so in, in, in chemistry, uh, you know, uh, when something in the presence of heat and in the presence of something else changes into something else, that's basically a chemical reaction. Okay. What I'm saying is that fats do not undergo chemical reactions in the cooking process at all. Okay. Unless you burn them to such high temperatures, they're starting to smoke. Nothing actually happens to fats. The only place fat starts to break down is inside your body. And in fact, most of it happens only in the intestine. Okay. Uh, fats are remarkably stable and they do not react with your food. Fats do not play a chemical role in your food. They actually play the role of physics, meaning that they are there to transfer heat. Okay. So the only reason we use fat when we deep fry uh, is because you want to apply heat that is more than 100 Celsius, you have to use oil. Okay. If you want to apply heat that is less than 100 Celsius, you can use water. But at 100 Celsius, water will boil. Okay. So it will turn into gas. So if you want to heat something above 100 Celsius, you need to use oil. And that's the only reason we actually use uh, oil as a cooking medium. There's no other reason. Fats do not react with food. And that's the same thing here, right? So it's not undergoing some chemical reaction to prevent it from sticking. All it does is that fats are hydrophobic, meaning that they don't stick with water. And so anything coated with fat will, will not stick to each other or to stick to other things that is watery and so on. So that's basically the basic science. Uh, the second thing is that you can now extend this knowledge into when you when you deal with rice, when you deal with rava, when you deal with anything else, anything that is starchy, right? Uh, or potatoes for that matter, right? When you wash things with water, um, what happens is that most starchy things we eat have two kinds of starches, amylose and amylopectin, okay? Uh, amylopectin is the loose thing that causes stickiness when it absorbs water. Uh, amylose is what gives a, a a more a chewier texture, right? So when you when you chew into a chapati or when you chew into say rice cooked rice, the the more uh, almost rubber like texture comes from amylose. Okay, the sticky texture on the outside comes from amylopectin. Okay, so the more the the more the amount of amylose something has, the less it will stick. Okay, so your basmati rice has more amylose, and so it is less. It's more likely to stay separate. Your pony rice has uh, more amylopectin, so it's more uh, jasmine rice has more amylopectin. It's far more likely to stick uh, after you cook, and so on. Right. And one of the things we often do is that uh, you soak it and you wash the excess surface amylo loose amylopectin off, so that uh, it doesn't stick after that. And by the way, this is the same reason we do this even for potatoes. Uh, that once you cut it, you you put it in water, one, to prevent it from oxidizing. The second thing you do is that you uh, shake it a little bit and all the white thing that sort of comes when you soak potatoes is also loose surface amylopectin, which again, prevents the, the potato from sticking uh, as much to the pan uh, as well, right? So this is this is clearly one important thing, right? Uh, the, but you can apply, you can use this knowledge of adding oil to something that is boiling or cooking in a completely different scenario where it will actually work. And that is you. when you are pressure cooking dal, it is great to add one teaspoon of oil or ghee. Okay. And what it actually does is that it prevents something called foaming. Okay. So dals, uh, for those of you, so most people don't realize that dals are actually completely inedible when they are, uh, when they are raw. So our bodies cannot digest them. In fact, in many cases, they are actively poisonous. Okay. So if you consume a large amount of raw rajma, uh, which is hard to do anyway, but if you do, uh, most, uh, unless we are herbivores like cows, we can't actually deal with it uh, because it has a lot of uh, anti-nutrients, if you will, right? So soaking and cooking is absolutely mandatory for those things in any case, right? And one of the things that happens is that there's a there's a family of chemicals called saponins, uh, which by the way comes from the Latin word for soap. Okay, so it causes the frothing and foaming. So every time you put dal at the pressure cooker top, is just uh, the sides are filled with that yellow, uh, foamy, frothy thing. Uh, that by the way spoils your pressure cooker. Uh, so therefore, if you want to prevent this, 
you add oil. A, a teaspoon of oil will actually prevent that and so on. So as I said, so this is the sort of format that I want to used to really think about take a very common misconception but really then dig deep and see whether that knowledge actually applies somewhere uh, else in the right way or so on so the idea is not to dismiss some of these uh, ideas because many of these things work uh, but they work in the wrong uh, situation and it's for, it's important for us to understand where they work and where they do not work right so this is number one the second common uh, thing uh, that we often hear is that you really have to knead chapati very well to get a very soft chapati now again I want, to, I want to use this uh, picture here to say that, yes, actually, it's right. If you knead your dough really, really well, you will get a soft chapati. There is, there is no doubt about that. Okay, But I want you to reconsider, reconsider the fact that it is the only the kneading that gives the softness to chapati. So that's what I want to change your mind about. right? So it, it, it turns out that you don't actually need to knead. Okay? Uh, wheat essentially is mostly starches but also has uh, anywhere between 10 to 14 percent protein okay depending on the kind of flour um, and again uh, so uh, if it's if it's maida it will have slightly more uh, protein because it's required for making bread and so on atta tends to have slightly less uh, because again the chucky milling process damages uh, some of the protein uh, but but deliberately so because otherwise chapati should be very chewy okay so that's why these are two different kinds of flours and so on right uh, so it turns out that uh, the moment you add water to flour uh, to any kind of atta or maida and so on, uh, there are two proteins called glutenin and gliadin that start forming what we call the gluten structures, right? So this is just wheat protein. Okay? Uh, and what happens is that all of the parts of the protein molecules that dislike water go on the outside where there is no water. And all the parts that love water come on the inside. So it forms a stretchy uh, 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 sort of a layer around the dough. So that's essentially how gluten essentially works, right? Uh, and what happens is that the the longer you just simply let it sit, uh, there will just be more gluten formed naturally, right? The act of kneading uh, simply just introduces more water into the molecules faster. And so therefore, you just maybe save them time, but you have to knead a lot. But if you have maybe, you know, shoulder ache and you have want to do other things and you can't be sitting and kneading for 10 minutes, just let it sit for 30 minutes. And that's all you need to do. The, I say unsalted. Honestly, you can add salt also uh, uh, because, you know, uh, adding the salt later is a bit tricky. You might have to uh, mix the salt in with a little bit of water and knead it in uh, after the fact. But for chapatis, you know, you can just go ahead and add the salt ahead. Uh, in general, because what salt does is that salt tends to make water not available to other things because the sodium and chloride ions will uh, sort of, you know, uh, dissolve into the uh, you know, uh, H and OH ions and not make that water available to other uh, things, uh, which is incidentally, by the way, when, when you want to, when you want to preserve something, this is why we add salt. Okay. Salt actually makes water less available to bacteria and fungi. And that's why uh, uh, they are not able to thrive in things that are very salty. Okay. So, so here, what happens is that uh, uh, the gluten proteins will simply just, the gluten structures will form if you just let it sit, okay? So what happens is that in in about 30 minutes, you'll have a dough that is just so soft of doing nothing. Um, and then if you find, if you look at expert bakers on the internet, right? A lot of the way they'll actually bake bread is to make the dough, uh, knead it partial and just leave it. 20 minutes later, they'll come and knead it slightly more, leave it. They sometimes do this over hours and hours, okay? Uh, so you get a really, really, really soft dough. And by the way, the this is in fact the trick to, uh, if, you're, if you're ever trying to make the South Indian Malabar parota, which is that sort of flaky parota at home, and you're like, I can never get the texture that I get on the, the, the guy in the street uh, restaurant. Uh, the reason for that is that he does that. This process is actually called autolysis. Okay, so this, this process of letting the dough sit and just auto form this gluten structures is called autolysis. The, the longer you do it, the softer the dough gets. And uh, this is why the parota fellow on the street starts kneading the dough uh, at 4 p.m. Okay, and he needs it. He needs it slightly and just leaves it, and uh, lets it uh, lets it sit. Then he needs it again and then he leaves it. Uh, and it actually stays for almost four hours. And then he'll make the parotas at 8 p.m. Okay, for the late night uh, uh, street stall and so on. And that is why those parotas are actually so soft, right? Uh, and so this is an important thing. So the other other general science is that the the more water you add uh, to the dough, 
the software anything will be so it's not just about kneading or or just letting it sit and so on uh sometimes people put a little less water in their dough and you and it'll and what will happen is that the water gets lost the moment you cook and so your chapati becomes like a papad okay so that's basically or it's slightly harder to eat and so on so the more water you add the softer it will be by the way you can also add eggs and milk to the dough that will also make uh, the dough soft again largely again because eggs and milk are mostly water but they also add fat okay and what fat does it actually prevents strong gluten structures from forming so that you don't get a chewy feeling it gets a slightly more uh, flaky uh, texture so your parathas and puris need to have less water and more fat in the dough because you don't want them to be chewy when you want something to be chewy you don't add fat when you don't want them to be chewy you need to add fat uh, that's why so the extreme example is that when you when you eat a puff a veg puff right the the crust of that is essentially made is just flour kneaded with mostly just oil very little water okay and so that's how you get a very flaky texture which sort of you know melts in your mouth uh, obviously uh, uh, biscuits are a great example right so biscuits is just mostly just flour and butter uh, and butter has a very tiny amount of water it's mostly fat right and so remember that flour plus water the more water more soft uh, the more fat more soft and more flaky right uh, more water means more soft and more chewy okay so that's basically the general uh principles which you can now you know use independently whichever way you want right milk also is the same reason milk also has fat and that's the reason why you can make a, a richer uh, tasting or a more softer when you make naans for example they they normally add milk uh, as opposed to uh, you can also by the way you can also do yogurt uh sometimes uh, people use yogurt in in paratha dough for example you will use yogurt as well right uh, so the more the more of fat the flakier something is okay so so the third common misconception is uh, on a on on one of the most considered to be one of the most dangerous chemicals uh, in in the indian kitchen which is baking soda uh, the bit that baking soda is bad for health and this takes me back to my first point uh, all food is essentially chemicals okay baking soda is sodium hydro, uh, sodium bicarbonate okay uh, salt is sodium chloride okay so they're both sodium salts uh so there is uh, so chemically speaking uh, there is uh, there is not really much difference the difference however is the fact that baking soda is alkaline meaning that it's not acidic it's not neutral it's alkaline okay so the way our tastes have evolved is that we tend to prefer acidic and neutral tastes mostly acidic tastes so most of our food is sour because our tongues pr prefer acidic taste sourness is acidity okay uh, more the amount of acid the sour it is right so lime juice acid tamarind acid yogurt acid right all of these are acids and so most of our food tends to be acidic okay uh, baking soda is basic and our tongues generally find too much basic taste slightly bitter okay this is just the way we we want and because baking soda also generates carbon dioxide uh, once it goes hits inside your stomach uh, and it reacts with the hydrochloric acid it will produce carbon dioxide which you which you feel uncomfortable okay so it's just flatulence that you that you kind of treat it as that otherwise there is actually no serious uh you know uh, danger of actually using baking soda but uh, let me kind of tell you that i want you to i don't want you to like suddenly start using baking soda and everything that you're using I, there is no need to either but i want you to reconsider why this is actually fantastic uh, as a as an ingredient okay it's a very magical multi purpose superhero when overused it can make food taste metallic and taste frankly bad right so yeah, and you don't want to do that okay but i honestly believe that you should keep a little bit of baking soda right next to the salt and sugar in your kitchen because it is that important okay now to start with here's all the things that it can do okay when you are uh, deep frying anything right you're deep frying pakoras you take some fresh vegetables and you coat them in a batter and you're baking pakoda and all of that and you want a beautiful lovely dark brown coloring uh, which by the way is not just color it's a ton of flavor because it's from a chemical reaction called the maillard reaction that happens at high temperatures between proteins and carbohydrates so sugars react with amino acids in food at high temperatures and that's how you get brown coloring on any food okay um you're you're frying a puri your the brown spots on your chapati the brown color of bread uh, uh the brown color of potatoes uh, golden brown of potatoes all of that is as a result of this fantastic reaction called maillard reaction okay and baking soda can accelerate that reaction 
um, and make it richer tasting and browner tasting. So, which is why a lot of, you know, if you buy, say, a pakoda mix, uh, which is based in rice flour, spices, and so on, it will always have a little bit of baking soda because it encourages this kind of beautiful browning. And it also, by the way, it generates carbon dioxide, which makes a pakoda uh, uh, crust a lot more softer. Anything with more air in it is going to be softer. That's because of the carbon dioxide. Okay. So, the second thing it can do is obviously because it's able to produce carbon dioxide in the presence of an acid, uh, it can be used as, as a backup uh, way of leavening idlis and breads and appams or anything, uh, especially if your, your biological way of doing it using yeast uh, fails. Because, you know, biological living things can be very whimsical. They can be very moody. Okay, they sometimes work. They may not work. They'll work in hot climates, won't work in cold climates. They may not work in Bangalore sometimes and so on. Right. So you have... Uh, Always, always what people will do is add a little bit of that as a backup. Uh, so in case you are a little bit unsure that your idli is going to ferment during cold climate, during winter, you're not really sure, etc. Tiny pinch of uh, baking soda will ensure uh, that you'll get your idlis perfectly right. And, and there is no problems at all. Okay. The third really amazing trick is what it does is that baking soda has the ability to break pectin, which is an important molecule in all plant cell walls, every vegetable every plant cell wall has pectin okay and this is what gives the rigid structure of plants right so broad sort of chemistry here right animal tissue is softer because it's made of muscle cells plant tissue is harder because it's made of pectin okay uh, and this is this is why trees and plants are rigid and when they are uh, the harder and firmer they are uh, they consider to be fresher um, and so on right so uh, what baking soda does in the cooking process is it breaks down pectin faster okay and you can use this for tremendously uh, useful purposes, right? And part of the reason why it has baking soda as a bad name is because restaurants tend to use baking soda too much uh, to save on gas, okay? So if they're cooking a lot of dal, they will add a little bit of baking soda to uh, reduce the cooking time because the uh, baking soda will uh, break down the pectin in the dal cell walls um, and allow the dal to become softer at a faster time in half the amount of energy that it takes, okay? Uh, if you don't use baking soda. So, but sometimes they end up overusing it and you end up tasting it and you feel uncomfortable and that's why it has a bad name. But at home, a tiny quarter teaspoon, if you're making something like say a chana, right? Uh, it'll make the chana ultra, ultra soft. And by the way, which is why grandmothers will also recommend that when you're cooking chana, when you're adding a tiny bit of baking soda, they will add a tea bag. What tea does, tea is an acid. So any leftover baking soda that is not reacted with the, with the pectin and so on will be neutralized by the tea. And the backup bonus is that the tea also adds a beautiful dark brown color to the chana. So that's why if you go to North India, they will often add a tea bag uh, to your chana. Uh, but the idea is that you add the tea bag along with a tiny pinch of baking soda. But now people have forgotten. They only add the tea bag, you know, and you get the color, but you get the benefits of actually baking soda. Okay. So this is one. Um, and by the way, you know, at the end of the day, it's a personal choice. If you do not want to use it in cooking, uh, it is one of the most amazing uh, cleaning agents along with vinegar, okay? Uh, vinegar and baking soda is one of the most fantastic uh, natural ways to clean anything uh, in the kitchen. Uh, particularly if you're someone who keeps a lot of, uh, let's say you keep seafood in, in the fridge, right? And uh, a seafood is, tends to be very smelly, uh, especially if you, you know, maybe you, you know, either there are fish pieces or there's like a fish gravy. Uh, every other vegetable will start smelling like fish uh, uh, in, in the fridge after a while. And so keeping just a small cup of baking soda will prevent that. Why? Because it's also a fantastic deodorizing agent in that it absorbs aromas, okay? So a tiny pinch of baking soda will reduce smells in your fridge by a huge amount. It's so this is to be honest. I mean, if I had to name one superstar ingredient far more than salt or uh, or sugar in the Indian kitchen, honestly, it should be baking soda. Unfortunately, you know, it has a bad name uh, because of pseudoscience and nothing else. Um, and I want to say a general thing, and I will, and I will uh, talk about it in the the context of the next one. In that, uh, in tiny quantities, most things are okay. In large quantities, all things are not hel not healthy. So it's about uh, it's about balance uh, and not really about uh, saying that no 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 I must not even have. Uh, I sometimes find people saying this about maida that I don't want anything even that has a tiny amount of maida. See there is uh, nutritionally unless you are eating uh, you know only maida based products three times a day, uh, using maida is absolutely important because it is the best quality uh, 
uh, wheat protein that you can get for baking breads and so on. If you try bake bread with atta, it comes out to be terrible. Okay, that's the reality. Uh, so you, even if you want to make bread with atta, you have to mix it with maida. There's just uh, no way to make it purely with atta and have it taste good. Again, you may like the dense, uh, chewy taste, but uh, if you want an airy, softer uh, uh, mouthfeel, you do have to use maida. So it's again, it's a question of balance. Uh, rather than say, no, this one ingredient is bad and I will never eat it. The idea is to... Uh, eat a diverse set of things uh, so that you can you are able to enjoy everything uh, a little bit uh, as opposed to you know uh, run into problems okay so a third common misconception is this uh, idea that microwaves destroy nutrition um, and taste in food uh, this is this is just bad science okay uh, microwaves have less energy in the electromagnetic spectrum than visible light okay so if you put your food outside in the sun there is more energy hitting that than the energy that is hitting the food in the microwave. The engineering trick involved there is only because that microwave has exactly the frequency of microwave used in, a, in, in your oven has exactly the amount of energy that happens to flip water molecules, especially if the microwave comes from this side, it'll flip it that side. If it comes from the other side, it'll flip it the other side. And so in a microwave, the, 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 free, the, the basically the direction of the waves is changing all the time. And so the water molecules are flipping inside the food. And so they heat up. Anything that's flipping is, is uh, increasing in energy. And so it heats up, right? So microwaves essentially heat water inside food. And most food is mostly water, okay? A carrot is 88% water. A cucumber is 95% water. A potato is sometimes, you know, almost 60-70% uh, water, right? Uh, and so that's all it's actually doing, right? Uh, it heats up water. Now, depending on the amount of energy you use, the setting, understand the settings in your microwave. Like, for example, using the low setting is a fantastic way to get butter to a spreadable consistency in 15 seconds. But if you put it on high, the water will practically evaporate from the butter and you'll basically get ghee. Okay. So understanding that and applying that science is, is really why. And you can do fantastic things uh, in the microwave once you understand that, right? Uh, you can cook potatoes very, very efficiently. You don't have to waste another vessel and put it in the pressure cooker and so on. In And, in, and for, if you're just cooking late night and you suddenly have a craving for rice, you can make enough uh, pulao for one in a microwave. Large amounts is not possible because there are dead spots within the microwave, but for small quantities, it's a fantastic uh, uh, way to cook. And by the way, and because it cooks only by heating the water in the inside, uh, nutritionally speaking, this is the least destructive way of cooking. Okay, cooking in the pressure cooker and cooking on an open pan is where you actually the you're you're losing the nutrition. You are not uh, in in a microwave. So this is this is actually an important uh, distinction. And uh, so by the way, I want to give you a small little hack. You know, you can actually uh, take things that are a mix of fat and water, like coconut milk uh, or yogurt, right, uh, and so on. Uh, and then essentially add uh, slightly sort of either semi-boiled vegetables and so on. Uh, add onion powder, garlic powder, because you don't want to cook the actual thing, um, and salt. Uh, and then in about five minutes, you can actually make an entire sabji in the microwave. That's all you need to do. Okay. Um, and because the, the the fat in the coconut milk will dissolve spices, uh, spice flavors. Okay. Spice flavors dissolve only in oils. They do not dissolve in water. Um, and that's the reason, and as I said right at the front, and that's the reason why you can actually make instant subjis directly um, in the microwave uh, and so on. Uh, and as I said, learn to use the low power setting, okay? Now, um, so the second of my these things is that uh, MSG is a Chinese conspiracy to cause uh, brain damage. Uh, again, this is just really down to bad science, and this myth continues to persist. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, Monosodium glutamate is made of sodium, okay, which is essential for body. And the other side is glutamic acid, which is an amino acid that makes up a good chunk of your body. So if you are if you are about 75 kgs, you have about 2 kgs of glutamic acid in your body. Okay, A quarter teaspoon of, uh, of its sodium salt is not going to harm you at all. Okay, so this is just this is uh, this is a myth that has come from the West uh, for racist reasons. Because in the 1970s, when Chinese immigrants uh, started Chinese restaurants in the U.S., uh, uh, white Americans decided to start blaming uh, some of the headaches that they got or for whatever other reasons. They started blaming it on Chinese food, and that myth has persisted. This is not true at all. If you go to uh, here's here's the other bad news for you. If you do not want to eat MSG, I suggest you must stop eating tomatoes, uh, mushrooms, uh, fish. Uh, and the Parmesan cheese uh, and a whole host of other things that are all exceedingly rich in exactly the same thing. Okay, In fact, if you use tomato paste, 
it is so so rich in glutamates uh and and people will say no that's a natural source this is not a natural source honestly chemistry doesn't work that way you know chemical molecules don't understand whether the molecule came from a plant or animal or whether they came from a uh, were produced in a laboratory I, at the chemical level they are all the same okay so the only thing that differs is you know the amount and the concentrations and and so on right so what msg actually is is that it's just concentrated umami flavor because uh one indian food tends to be low on umami particularly if it's vegetarian food uh and particularly if it's a uh, vegetarian food that does not contain concentrated amounts of tomato okay uh, one of the reasons why a lot of vegetarian cooking tends to use tomatoes on a regular basis is because it gives that lingering savory flavor uh of of umami right uh you would automatically get it if you're cooking any kind of meat or bones and so on because you know that's essentially where a lot of umami flavors are our preference for umami flavors comes from ancient man's uh need to eat a lot more protein so and and protein has no flavor and so for us to develop a taste for it uh if you go to japanese or chinese or southeast asian food very very heavy on umami and to make it clear umami is another kind of taste bud in addition to salt sweet uh sour and bitter umami is the fifth kind of taste bud we have right uh and msg is simply uh, the ability to add a concentrated amount of umami right at the end uh to to any food now here's the interesting thing actually because it has sodium and anything with sodium tastes salty uh you can actually a mix of uh and it is absolutely safe in small quantities uh in fact in any dish that you add a little bit of msg you can you can add less salt and that by the way is much better for health huh? so your salt will actually damage your heart but a tiny amount of msg will taste salty and it give you umami taste as well okay so and again i and i the caveat here is that there are a tiny number of people who may be allergic to uh, msg right and so again as i said if it works for you there is no problem at all and if you are able to eat street food chow mein um and it seems to be okay with you you're perfectly fine adding a tiny pinch of this to any food is perfectly fine as long as you don't overdo it uh and remember that you know what is the strongest source of glutamates in the human diet human breast milk human breast milk has 10 to 100 times uh more glutamates than anything else okay so all our babies grew up eating the equivalent of msg all their child lives okay so let's not worry about this so this is basically msg uh and the last couple of things that i want to do baby after which i want to do more q and a right uh is a common misconception is that pressure cooking is measured in whistles okay now uh this is an example of knowledge that it works so if you have just a regular stuff uh, and you cook your food um it is going to be fine you know you 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 wait for three whistles to come and your rice will be done or whatever five whistles for dal or whatever heuristic you use is fine right but the problem is that that's not how pressure cooking works and so today if your people are using induction stoves your three whistle method will not work because the three whistles will come quickly and you'll find that the rice is actually uncooked so people are now adapting and saying no 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 five whistles i will adjust to seven whistles so the better way to do it is to say that let the pressure cooker come to pressure one whistle reduce the heat and that you're maintaining pressure in fact you'll find our grandmothers doing that the idea is that let it come to one pressure you reduce and then you wait you measure time and then after 10 minutes etc now again practically speaking so the reason we switch to whistles is very simple women started working in india and so therefore the last thing they have the time for is to sit and start an alarm clock and look and see whether uh, five five minutes is over or seven minutes is over and whistle is just easy to hear right it's just a easy metric so people went for the convenience but all i'm saying is that understand why pressure cooking works that way which is that once excess pressure is released then the cooker takes a little bit more time to build to pressure again you get another sound okay as long as the heat is low it will always maintain pressure meaning that that is the true metric of how much your dish is actually cooked right um, and by the way you can use this to uh, you can use some of these principles really really effectively so did you know for instance that you could actually pressure cook without water okay because most of the things you cook have water uh, like a carrot has water uh your cucumbers and most vegetables you cook almost always have water or onions and so on right uh and since a pressure cooker cooks at a much higher temperature than the boiling point of water there is an opportunity to get some fantastic flavors that you would otherwise never get okay here's a fan is an amazing way to get get some really fantastic organic carrots okay just uh uh just chop off the uh, the tips remove a little bit of the peel you know you just wash it so a lot of the flavor is actually in the peel as well so you don't want to remove too much of that uh and then you just chop them up and 
coat them liberally with butter. Okay. The only reason we're using fat is so that it you prevent the carrots from directly touching the hot metal. So that's why you add some kind of fat, butter or ghee or whatever it is. Okay. Butter is generally better here. Okay. And then you don't need to add water. And you pressure cook for about three to five minutes. Meaning you hear one whistle, wait three to five minutes and stop. Uh, you will get a completely browned, dark brown orange uh, carrot because it's undergone the Bayard reaction. So much flavor that all you need to do is puree it, then add some salt. And you will actually get a tomato soup and you'll be wondering what all ingredients and what all spices and what all flavors did you add? Because the magic is all that flavor came from the carrot itself. All you had to do was brown it. And normally when you just pressure cook, you're not browning it. And so you're not getting the flavor. So which is why if you put it in an oven and it gets brown, you get the same thing. But you can do that in a pressure cooker directly without water. And again, do this for short periods of time. You might have to adjust the time depending on your heat and your model so that you don't end up burning it and so on. Some experimentation, but it's a fantastic way to pressure caramelize uh, many things. You can make uh, French onion soup very quickly by taking tons of the onions, putting liberal amounts of butter, pressure cooking without uh, water onion is mostly water, 89% water actually, right? Uh, and then you actually get a fantastic dark brown uh, onion soup, which you can then puree. And all you need to add is salt and, and you're essentially done, right? So, uh, and last but not the least, if you're someone who cooks meat, uh, see meat actually, most people think that uh, meat is, uh, takes a longer time to cook. Actually, meat takes a less time to cook and lower temperature. Vegetables need a higher temperature and some of them need a longer amount of time. Okay. So generally pressure cooking is terrible for meat. Uh, so as much as possible, unless you're cooking uh, dark red meat and so on, uh, which, which is, uh, which has a lot of bones uh, and it takes a lot more time to cook down, etc. Uh, generally avoid pressure cooking uh, for meat and so on. Um, and my last sort of uh, uh, this things, last couple of things is the fact that uh, marination adds flavor. Actually, apply to meat or vegetables, whatever it is. Okay, it doesn't matter. People think marination adds flavor and they believe it, it, it the flavors actually go inside. So I'm going to generalize this knowledge. Somehow there is this idea that in people's heads that it seems natural that somehow I, there's a way which I can take spices and then I can make them go inside an ingredient. Whether it's meat or vegetables, it doesn't matter. I have some bad news. Okay, uh, nothing goes inside uh, meat or vegetables, by the way. Okay. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's a very simple experiment. So, you know, we are also meat at the end of the day, right? Uh, okay, if you can apply ginger garlic here um, and wait for 24 hours, uh, do you think you'll get marinated? Do you think the garlic is going to go inside? Much like the way you expect uh, it to happen um, on an actual, you know, piece of chicken or fish, it doesn't work that way because uh, our bodies, our cells, etc., will prevent these things from getting inside, okay? The only thing that can actually get inside is salt. So, which is why if you want to add flavor to anything, you want to soak it in salt, not in spices. Okay. And the only reason we do marination with yogurt and all of that is to get all of those spices to stick to the surface so that when we cook it and when you bite it, it seems like the flavor is coming from inside, but it's actually only coming from the surface. There's a video that you can watch where somebody puts a marinade with some ultraviolet light and sees how far it penetrates into uh, the food barely the surface. Okay. And by the way, if you are say doing this with paneer or with a vegetable, uh, where these spices will not even stick, you need to add some kind of starch binder, like a basin or something. So that's how you get the, uh, uh, you get it to stick to the surface. Uh, uh, so nothing is actually penetrating. So the, ba so, so the, the shocking news is that 30 minutes of marination is the same as 24, 48, 72 hours of marination. It makes no difference. Okay. So that's the, that's the thing here, but soaking in salt, which is called brining, particularly for meat, actually improves the flavor. The salt gets in and it also prevents moisture loss, right? So, where, you know, when we run a marathon and we drink uh, sugar and salt, the reason we drink the salt along with our glucose is to prevent us from losing further water by sweating. Um, and that's the same principle uh, to, to get meat to be succulent uh, as well. And you can use it to with anything that is high protein and so on, right? Um, and you don't have to over marinate at all, right? And my last misconception, and since we have to talk about uh, vegetables here, right? Uh, fresh and flawless looking vegetables are fresh. Okay. I know it sounds shocking, uh, but I hate to break it to you, right? Uh, I want you to rethink the definition of fresh. I don't want you to change or say that, oh, no, no, you're wrong. Okay. I want you to rethink the definition of fresh. Okay. Most vegetables, industrially produced non organic vegetables, for the most part, okay, are produced very far away from cities very far away from where you are buying it. And so they have to be harvested unripe. 
they have to survive storage and transportation okay so your tomatoes are practically harvested green uh, and then they they become red on the way to you okay bananas are harvested completely unripe uh, and so so here's so what happens is that when uh, industrial agriculture unfortunately forces you to pluck or harvest the vegetable not at peak nutrition and taste but so that it can survive storage and transportation that's that's number one okay here's the shocking news frozen vegetables if you are growing vegetables that are being uh, uh, frozen okay they are actually harvested close close to the exact peak taste and nutrition because they are frozen pretty quickly okay the once they are frozen uh they all biological activity actually stops at minus 15 celsius all biological activity is stopped and time freezes okay so here's the shocking news the typical if you go to a typical supermarket uh, store vegetable uh, that looks very beautiful flawless and shiny etc etc uh, if you ask the question is that fresh or should i go to the fridge and take my frozen uh, piece or corn is that fresh the shocking answer is that the frozen one is likely to be fresher because it was harvested exactly when it was riper and frozen pretty soon afterwards on the other hand the other one was harvested months ago and spent its time ripening and being exposed to the air all this while so the reason why we talk about organic and local etc is that you want to reduce the amount of transportation and the amount of distance and time between the farmer and when you actually buy something right so so here's the answer are, fr are frozen vegetables fresher than fresh vegetables in all situations no the only thing better than frozen vegetables is if you grow your own uh, vegetables or if you are able to buy directly from a farmer as early as possible after the harvest that's when you truly get freshness okay um, and you incentivize that ecosystem that allows you to therefore uh, get vegetables harvested as close to the harvest time as possible and not if the guy is selling to a middleman the guy is selling to a big warehouse etc he'll harvest it really really unripe okay and that is how the modern day system works and this is why you need to know that you need to understand this concept and my last point is that is something that people don't understand which is that uh, that why does organic food taste better than uh, non organic produce why do organic vegetables taste better than you know uh, non organic uh, vegetables and so on is is very non intuitive okay uh, plants if you realize uh, cannot move okay they don't have like hands and they can't like defend themselves and so on so a plant defends itself against an animal that wants to eat it using chemicals using poisons using defensive chemicals using irritants okay so your onion produces uh, something uh, that causes tears in the eye uh, you know which is fine uh, for us because you know we then cook it and so the the tear inducing thing goes away but if a cow is trying to eat the onion raw it's going to be a nasty experience so so the reason an onion does what it does is to prevent a cow from eating it okay uh, and likewise you know garlic that has a so garlic and onion produce sulfur based or uh, volatile things that animals find very nasty okay uh, spices produce a lot of antibacterial anti uh, microbial and anti insect chemicals that we consider to be fantastic aromas okay uh, and so here's the interesting thing so the more a plant fights against pests the more flavor it has i mean it may be smaller but it will uh, it will taste better right so here's the so sometimes the people uh, you know how do you uh, people will say how do you select uh, vegetables uh, in the market and people will say that let me take the largest smoothest uh, looking vegetable wrong take the smaller misshapen slightly scarred vegetables because chances are it's likely to have undergone some kind of pest attack and it fought it off and it was successful against it and the fact that it was successful and it made it to your market is is going to mean that it'll have ton tons more flavor so next time you go to the market and pick up tomatoes don't pick the ones that look beautiful pick the ones that look ugly uh and pick the ones that look small and you'll often find that organic produce looks smaller because they they don't use pesticides uh what ends up happening uh, is that the plants have to produce their own pesticides uh, those things are actually tasty for us okay so that is exactly how why organic uh, produce actually tastes uh, uh, better than uh, non organic produce um, and my last but not the least because the book is about masala lab remember that whole spices you know last longer than powdered spices so in general buy whole spices and grind them before you use them rather than buy powdered spices which oxidize very very quickly So if you buy like a packet of garam masala, it will become sand in about two weeks, okay? uh, unless you store it in the freezer. So if you're storing uh, powdered spices, store them in the freezer, uh, and so on, right? Uh, and again, remember, when you cut a vegetable, 
chemical reaction start right so if you if you just if you use a whole garlic it will be mild garlic flavor if you chop the garlic stronger if you mince the garlic even stronger and if you paste the garlic maximum amount of flavor okay and again so you you determine having more flavor is not always the right answer you might actually want a milder flavor in a rasam or something right so remember that the act of cutting is also the act of cooking um, and so if you chop an onion from root to stem you damage fewer cells so if you're making a salad you want to cut the onion only in that direction and not in the opposite direction so it'll have a milder uh, flavor in your mouth uh, but if you want very strong oniony flavors in a dish then obviously you're going to cut in all directions so that you damage more cells you you generate more of that a uh, chemical that we then perceive as onion flavor okay uh, and so just a small little aside do you know why our eyes tear up uh, so there's a so when you cut an onion a few seconds about uh, 30 seconds after you cut it there's an enzymatic reaction that produces a chemical called synpropane thiol oxide okay which is volatile volatile meaning that it will float uh, up and it's it's not uh, it's not a liquid right so it's a gas so it floats up uh, and the moment it hits your eye uh, it breaks down into tiny amounts of sulfuric acid so literally uh, an onion is doing an acid attack on your eyes but doing it in very very mild quantities okay so but your eyes immediately sense the sulfuric acid and they start tearing up to dilute the acid so that's why we cry so yes yeah, so i mean onion literally is is a biological weapon but albeit a very very weak one so it's it's quite fascinating so if you want to tell the story to your kids that you should eat more onions because think about it right it literally produces something that that uh, uh, that that breaks down into small amounts of sulfuric acid in your eyes it is a fantastic uh, story to tell your kids as well right um, and again spice flavor molecules tend to dissolve in oil and alcohol not water so if you are if you are someone who does not have a hang up about using alcohol if you see europeans they will often cook in wine or cook in brandy and so on um by the time the cooking is done all the alcohol is actually evaporated but it adds tons of flavor uh, because alcohol dissolves more spices prevents them from escaping to the air uh, and so on right so which is also why if you are adding powdered spices add them closer to the end of the cooking process if you add them right at the start then by the end of the cooking process uh, they'll have uh, a lot less flavor so either you can add a large amount of spice at the start or a tiny amount of spice at the end you know it's usually it's up to you right uh, and so go make some delicious food and uh, this is my book you can buy it Uh, on amazon or most other uh, stores anyway so maybe now we'll do you know q and a i guess thanks krish thanks for that uh, really really interesting session um for everyone who's interested in the book i am sharing the link in the chat um and you can go ahead and buy the book and if you do have any questions uh, just put them down in the chat box and we'll uh, we'll get to them meanwhile uh, some people had sent in some questions earlier which i'll uh, take one by one yes. and um, this i think this first question is very interesting because it's uh, it's a hotly debated topic and many people have different opinions on this what is the best way to cook rice is it pressure cooking or is it draining or is it open pot what's the what's the best way to cook rice i think the uh, when it comes to cooking uh, in general it's better to have a nuanced understanding of what best means right because uh, it depends on multiple dimensions right uh, so there is yes so if you it depends on one what is the dish you're making uh, uh, and two whether your goal is uh, flavor or purely nutrition okay sometimes you can't have both in in many situations you can't have both okay uh, almost often more flavor or, or very regularly means you know less nutrition so that's just a balance that you have to strike okay so if you're cooking rice for biryani or pulao uh, let's say or let's say take pulao first so in general you have to use a high amylose rice like basmati siraka samba or one of those varieties of rice okay it is almost always good to soak it uh, uh for 30 minutes uh because you get more even cooking so almost always for all kinds of rice it's always good to soak okay uh and the other thing you need to do is that you uh, also need to wash it obviously because you know the the polishing process for rice often introduces talc and many other things you want to wash all of that so and again it also washes off a lot of the loose amylopectin uh, which helps you uh, prevent the rice from sticking okay and uh, see, unless you're cooking some kind of brown rice or uh, red rice and all that Uh, i don't think you should be overly bothered about the nutrition of rice there isn't much okay um, and any and all nutrition um, if especially if it's parboiled rice is inside the rice it's not on the surface so you're not losing much in the in the soaking and washing process uh, and so on okay um, and in fact with dal uh, a lot of the stuff that's on the outside 
are things that you want to discard uh, it, because if you actually cook uh, dals without washing they're all anti nutrients they will prevent your body from absorbing the nutrients so you actually want to soak and and discard never use that so your grandmothers will find that they never use the water in which they soak the dal that water is actually bad so you need to discard it and so on so when it comes to rice if you're making pulao generally a basmati or a, a siraga samba sort of rice uh, soak for 30 minutes after which uh, you essentially the for the best fluffy flavor uh, it's a good to cook in an open pot uh, pressure cooking is far more likely to cause the rice to kind of stick together uh, whereas open pot cooking gets you very fluffy softer uh, texture so i would actually say open pot is better okay when you're cooking rice for biryani the best method is to add excess water along with salt uh, so you partially cook it so you can then discard the rest of the water and then then cook the rice again along with the meat and other things you layer it with vegetables and others uh, you, because you're cooking the rice twice so you want to partially cook when you want to partially cook you want to cook it uh, in a lot of excess water and then drain the water by the way nobody is stopping you from you cooking it in excess water and draining it so that you don't have to worry about how much exact water to add uh, if you're generally cooking rice in any other way be it steamed uh, be it but in general in an open pot adding just the right amount of water and letting the rice absorb all that right amount of water and then letting it sit uh, for about 15 minutes undisturbed so that the starch actually crystallizes it's called retrogradation so that it actually then gets that right texture uh, is the best uh, from a taste standpoint uh, as for nutrition white rice not much nutrition anyway so i i wouldn't bother with that at all yeah thanks thanks um i'm going to pick one from the chat box uh, sejal kothari asks and i think this is uh, in relation to what you defined about the freshness of vegetables she yes. said what about greens turning yellow like coriander and kale does that mean that uh, they've lost their nutrition and are they like are they to be discarded how does that No, so so essentially uh so green in plants comes from a molecule called chlorophyll okay so uh what happens is that over time uh anything uh, uh breaks down in the presence of oxygen okay so uh, uh, oxidize oxidation is is the most common enemy of uh, most things in general okay now the answer is that it typically depends okay so there are some things whose flavor and nutrition actually improves with oxidation um Uh, like lime juice okay so incidentally if you squeeze lime juice let it sit open exposed to the air for about an hour it tastes better okay uh, but at the same thing if you do orange juice it will taste bitter but lime juice will taste better uh, greens in general over time what happens is that the chlorophyll molecule ends up getting oxidized it reacts with other things so it loses the green color uh, but at the end of the day uh, you don't lose as much nutrition as people think you do in that you don't need to discard it see the only time you discard something is that when it when it when it looks completely brown mush and you can see effects of fungus um, and other infections uh, that turn the and it smells uh, funny that's the only time you discard anything actually so as indians you know famously we are we do not waste stuff uh, yellow coriander is is perfectly fine uh, so it's it's largely uh, people think that people have a sense that somehow yellow is sickly and etc etc uh, that's only true for edibles not true for uh, uh, not true for plants so you you're quite fine yeah okay um i'm going to pick another one from the question that was sent in uh, why is it that in some recipes we put in ginger garlic paste and in some we put either ginger or garlic separately like what what is what is ginger garlic paste do and what is ginger and garlic do separately no so they I, honestly no difference okay it's yeah. it's purely a taste preference uh so in general in india we have a very we have like sort of a love hate relationship with garlic right uh, it is on the one hand the most intense uh, spice right a tiny amount can be detected uh, in the in the final product because it has such an intense flavor right uh, and particularly at pasted garlic is very 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 intense a tiny amount is really enough um, and so on. it had such a tremendous amount of flavor okay uh, and and instead for those of you who are interested so the the family of molecules that give garlic its intense aroma and yeah. onions too to, to to some extent uh, are sulfurous molecules uh, which by the way uh, is also what is behind the smell of asafoetida and also fish and also curry leaves okay so part of the reason why this family of things particularly onion garlic have have been treated by religious people in this part of the world as being oh you know you must not eat it on uh, religious days and so on is because of the fact that they lend plant based food meat like flavors that's the reason okay 
there's no other reason um and so therefore they've been classified as you know tamasic and all that sort of stuff uh, but the reality uh, is that it's one is that it's tremendously healthy uh, both uh, uh, garlic a lot more than onions but yeah garlic definitely and so on uh, and uh, and people will sometimes say that no i will use asafoetida instead uh, uh, instead of using onion garlic as if that's uh, but asafoetida has exactly similar flavors and they come from very similar chemicals okay so uh, chemically speaking you know if you're eating asafoetida and not eating onion and garlic i would actually argue you are eating onion and garlic okay, effectively okay so in that sense there is uh, and so it's a stylistic choice so often it's a religious choice to say that we will not eat garlic on certain days or we have low tolerance for garlic and so on ginger tends to be uh, more universally accepted um, and so it doesn't really matter uh, but the more ginger you add the the sharper uh, the heat it adds heat so people want to add a little bit of less ginger as as for how much you add when you add none of that makes a difference as as i said the earlier you add in the cooking process the flavor will be a lot less strong the later you add the stronger it will be so if you're making lassuni dal then frying onions right at the end will add that really sharp um, uh, garlic flavor right at the end because you want the garlic flavor at the end of the day it's purely a flavor choice there is no difference otherwise um i'm going to take another one from the chat box i know that a lot of questions are coming we'll try and take uh, as many uh, sure, questions sure. as we yeah. can yeah that's okay uh, I'm, i'm flexible yeah <laughs> uh okay so jagan asks it said that unpolished dal is better than polished so i guess one question is why is that and second so unpolished sorry unpolished which one dals Pulse. dals yeah okay yeah 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 um this is better than polished and second secondly uh, while cleaning with water are any nutrients lost so uh, again so uh, you know it's it's quite common so first first and foremost i am not a nutritionist so in general i tend to focus on flavor so um it's better to ask don't ask me nutrition based questions but i can i can tell you the chemistry of what happens what gets lost as for whether that's good or not you kind of decide okay uh so it the answer is it depends uh, and again it's a question is that in general um i don't think you should determine uh, where you and how you're getting your nutrients based on whether you're going to lose it as a result of soaking or not the solution to that problem is to just eat a diverse set of foods knowing what comes from where uh, uh and that way get all your nutrition rather than really worry about whether a specific cooking technique uh is is uh, is going to reduce uh, nutrition or or increase nutrition uh the, see remember that at a basic level all cooking all forms of cooking is reduction of nutrition at some level okay uh with some exceptions like for example tomatoes uh cooked tomatoes more nutritious than raw tomatoes cooked carrots more nutritious than raw carrots cooked dals more nutritious than raw dals okay uh parboiled rice more nutritious than raw rice okay so there is uh, so the your idli rice is actually more nutritious uh, than raw rice and so on so it's really about understanding that rather than saying that oh this one particular step etc uh, uh you can fix this problem by doing different techniques so maybe one day uh so if you're worried about whether cooking uh, greens like your 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 spinach and all that is reducing nutrition to a small extent yes okay rather than worry about saying that no 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 therefore i will never cook greens okay i will only eat salad is the wrong approach uh, your better approach is to say that let me eat as many different greens as possible some i will cook some i will eat raw and by the way there are many greens you cannot eat raw uh, they're just too bitter okay so you can only eat lettuce and some of these things raw but if you you want like say drumstick leaves or uh, or one of batua or all of that you do have to cook okay so but yeah, the, it's about really percentages so don't break your head too much about uh, how much of this is getting lost uh, and so on instead just do different things uh, and then you'll be fine thanks um i'll take another one uh and this is again something that many people have different opinions on which is which is the best oil for cooking all of them or none of them so let me let's be quite honest okay so fats have been uh, we've been subject to a lot of misinformation about fats uh, over the last you know i i remember when i grew up uh fats were the enemy so we had to reduce fat because fat was cholesterol okay so and then then people said no no uh, so if you had to use a fat use uh, unsaturated fat because you know it is uh, less cholesterol than using saturated fat uh, and and so on so the answer is a lot more trickier okay in that it all depends absolutely eating more fats in general is going to increase the risk of cardiovascular uh, diseases there's no doubt about that okay uh 
and to some extent maybe uh, eating mono unsaturated fats like say olive oil virgin olive oil and so on uh, does reduce the risk to a small extent but at the end of the day if you are using olive oil three times a day uh, the net effect of all of the good stuff is much much less okay so at the end of the day it's about moderation rather than really figuring out uh, what to do so i i you know, and and the fact of the matter is that you know people in kerala eat coconut oil uh, their uh, their their entire lives three times a day and they seem more or less okay in fact they on an average they seem healthier than other parts of india so it is it is not the oil uh, that really is the cause of their health i mean it's wider society and healthcare and many other you know social welfare that 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 addresses that problem rather than and also the amount of food you eat and your eating habits uh, and and so on right at the end of the day uh, use the fat that is appropriate for the taste and flavor of that dish if you're making a bengali dish use mustard oil right if you're using punjabi dish use ghee uh, if you're making a south indian dish use sesame oil or or coconut oil right at the end of the day it doesn't matter there are a few exceptions for example we do know that hydrogenated uh, fats which have trans fats are not necessarily good but for for the most part we've largely reduced our consumption of vanaspati um, and dalda as a result but nowadays you do get hydrogenated palm oil which is vanaspati which is also zero trans fat as well okay in small quantities where a where a recipe actually requires it you know like for example if you're making biscuits and all that uh, you honestly cannot make biscuits entirely with butter okay they'll burn and all that so you so if you eat any biscuits chances are they are using hydrogenated uh, uh palm oil and that is now trans fat free okay so so it is just it is it's a very tricky subject and the the simplest answer is eat less okay uh, and eat anything you want but eat less in small quantities so as long as you're doing that it should be fine uh pick the one that is the right appropriate for the flavor and i i will tell you one other thing okay people nowadays say i will only use cold press oil which is good actually for day to day cooking using cold press oils much much better than using ultra refined uh, oils and so on um uh, for day to day cooking i think that's perfectly fine here is the problem if you use cold press oils for deep frying you are damaging any and all whatever benefits you think you're getting and in fact you're actually going to end up consuming something that's actively bad and carcinogenic for you okay uh, unrefined cold pressed oils are not good for deep frying um uh, unless it is ghee okay ghee is 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 an exception and mustard oil is an exception everything else not safe so if you are deep frying you're making puri on a special occasion etc uh, etc et please use refined oil refined vegetable oil okay do not use unrefined cold press oils for deep frying because they have a smoke point that is well below the temperature that you require to fry uh, and they start producing lots of very nasty uh, chemicals uh, once you heat them beyond a point so you do need uh, uh, refined fats for that special occasion so but for day to day use i think any kind of cold press oil is is, is perfectly fine and occasionally as a special this thing adding a tiny bit of or using butter uh, is i think is perfectly fine okay um we are almost our time so maybe i'll just take uh, another one or two questions um there is uh, one question which is is it better to cook dals rajma chana etc in a pot which takes many hours versus yes. the same thing cooking in a pressure cooker in less time which which method is yeah. better if you have the time and patience uh open pot cooking will always get you better mouth feel and texture because the cooking process is slower so you get a very uh you get a far far more uh, that's why actually slow cooking is is a thing so there's something called a slow cooker which lets you do that as well right uh so in general yeah but as i said cooking is not always an endeavor to maximize taste okay uh it, it is it is a balance between taste uh nutrition and convenience and all of these three can be at exceedingly opposite perspectives right and i'll tell you this very honestly right most guys in india will say oh you know i would i would like only things that are slow cooked boss i mean if if the if the woman in your house is having to balance education and career and a child and you do none of the housework and you're expecting that everything has to be in open pot like you know great indian kitchen level stuff mm-hmm. please go and cook it yourself okay so please do not lecture women on on please you know, you do slow cooking you do all of that you do it okay on a weekend you you sit and do make the dal makhani over 8 hours all of that is fine right uh, so it is ultimately a balance um, and again the only thing is we really sometimes uh, give very extreme opinions saying that oh no no if i do if i cook in pressure cooker it will taste very bad and all that no it it may not taste as good as the open cooked one but it you can do that in 15 minutes and you can be doing 20 other things the convenience and the value of that is is far better likewise nutrition also see all cooking 
destroys nutrition to a small degree. It's just that you have to adjust by making sure that you are eating many healthy things. You're eating a mixture of raw and cooked uh, and you're eating, you're not snacking on uh, processed snacks and so on. That is what will get you sort of good health over uh, uh, these kinds of things. So yes, open pot gets you slightly better taste if that's what you're asking. Uh, but again, and if you can do that daily, do it, but you don't have to on a special occasion, maybe on a Sunday, maybe to, uh, try it and see. Yes. Okay, I'll just take one last question and I know most uh, South Indians will uh, like this. At what point does the tamarind go into the sambar to, uh, and, and, and pe different people have different uh, opinions on when the tamarind goes in. And so yep. is there a logic to it and like what what is? Yeah, so, so tamarind, uh, so, so let's understand the role of acids in general, right? So uh, any cooking, particularly in India, is a balance of fat and spices, which gives you aroma, okay? Uh, souring agent. Every region has its own souring agent, okay? Um, in the south, it's tamarind. Uh, in the west coast, it's kokum or uh, kodampuli or malabar tamarind. Um, Amchur uh, in the north. Anardana, again, in the north. Uh, and so on. And sometimes, you know, uh, in the, the west coast, you also use vinegar, okay? So coconut vinegar, apple cider vinegar, and so on. Typically, coconut vinegar is probably more commonly used. And these... All of these are ultimately just acids. So they are, they, they are sour in taste. Uh, and so the lower the pH, the stronger the acid. So uh, things, tamarind is actually pretty strong. Concentrated tamarind paste is very, very sour, right? Uh, whereas uh, something like, uh, say, an amchur is not that sharp uh, an acid and so on. So you, can, uh, you get a more muted uh, flavor, if you will. Uh, and some acids like lime juice, uh, you should not cook. So you should only add it at the end because cooked lime juice doesn't taste good. Okay, So... So you have to think of it as ultimately you're adding an acid, right? Now, the question is that tamarind is more than just the acid. It's got other things. It's got some sugars, all of those other things, right? So the general idea is that the longer you cook, you the acids are far more likely to react with something else um, and, and, and lose their sharpness, okay? So the longer you cook tamarind, the less sour, uh, the more balanced sourness you'll get. The less you cook tamarind, the sharper, the sourness. So at the end of the day, it's a personal taste thing. Okay. If you like a mild, rounded kind of sourness, add it early. Okay. If you like a sharper, bolder kind of uh, sourness, uh, add it later. Some people will like it. Some people will not like it. There is no one single right way. And I, I will say this generally, there is no one single right way to cook anything. It's all has to do with your personal tastes. Okay. Uh, and the interesting thing is that personal tastes are wired into the part of the brain that deals with nostalgia. So which is why people get very, very worked up that no, no, it has to be exactly the way I remember it. That's why we are so attached to our food and how authenticity and it has to be cooked this way. The reality is everybody cooks with whatever they have uh, when they have it. Nobody's like saying that, oh, if I, so which is why often, you know, uh, so the other day I, I played a, a, not a prank, but you know, um, I made uh, uh, sambar, okay? Um, I didn't use tamarind, okay? Um, I used another souring agent. I used vinegar. Okay, uh, and vinegar because it's just pure acid. You can add it any time; it doesn't really matter, right? And you only need to add a tiny bit. Okay, uh, and I fed it to people in the family and said, "Hey, do you, do you taste anything different?" They said, "Oh, this is a really good sambar. I mean, it's uh, really nice, etc." They didn't tell the difference. Uh, and then I told them that I, I didn't use tamarind; I actually used uh, vinegar. Uh, they were like, "Oh, how, why was I not able to detect it?" Because that's the thing. You can't smell acids. Acids you can only taste. Okay, So you can only smell spices. Uh, and uh, uh, whether tamarind or... Th there is an aroma of tamarind uh, that comes from the other things other, other than just the acids and tamarind. But that's all going to get muted in comparison to the dhania powder and the, the sambar powder and all the other spices. Okay, So there is no intrinsic smell of tamarind that's in your final dish at all. So, so incidentally, so you can make sambar and rasam with vinegar and people won't be able to tell the difference. You can make sambar and rasam with amchur. You can make sambar and rasam with anardana. Okay, So this is for North Indians who want to make South Indian food. If they tell you, oh, no, no, you need to use tamarind, you can annoy them by using any acid of your choice. Uh, and it will be perfectly fine. So... So it's ultimately about you want a milder flavor, uh, add it ahead. You want a stronger flavor, add it closer to the end. That's all. That, that's all there is. That's really interesting. Uh, thanks. I think we're out of time. Unfortunately, there are uh, more questions coming in, but we won't be able to take them. Um, do you want to plug your book and social media handles and so on? So this is uh, so this is uh, my book. It's available on um, all. Uh, uh, 
platforms. Uh, and uh, my uh, Twitter handle is uh, Krish Ashok. And uh, my Instagram handle where I do most of the food stuff is uh, underscore Masala Lab. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get Masala Lab because it's owned by some uh, company that hasn't posted tweets in a while. But uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, so my handle is underscore uh, Masala Lab on Instagram uh, for food related stuff. Right, uh, and then if you want to, you know, maybe uh, uh, you can, you know, send me or post some of these questions on um, Instagram or Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer them offline uh, as well. I think there were a fair number of other questions as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Krish. Thanks so much. It was a fantastic session, and thank you everyone for joining in. Thanks, thanks everyone. See you. Bye bye.